Hello, and welcome to SoberCast, where we provide AA speaker meetings and workshops in podcast format. We're an ad-free podcast, and if you enjoy listening, please help us be self-supporting by visiting SoberCast.com, look for the donate link, and drop a dollar or two into our virtual basket. We hope you enjoy the podcast. Have a great day. My name is Cookie, and I'm an alcoholic. And my home group is Potpourri in Manhattan, and they've put up with me all these years. Uh, when I first came to my convention, my first convention, there was a man named Tom M. from uh, Suffolk County. And he used to say, can you hear me now? <laughs> Somebody going like that in the back. Um, he used to say, if... Uh, your home group is in the best home group in Alcoholics Anonymous. Don't leave it and come mess up mine. Stay and fix yours. So I've done that at my home group all these years, and uh, my GSR is sitting in the second row and making me feel comfortable. And uh, and all the people that came before, uh, a special thanks to Floyd, who isn't with us today, for uh, inviting me. There was a time when I came to Alcoholics Anonymous when nobody invited me anyplace. And as a matter of fact, Alcoholics Anonymous was the only place that said welcome. Everybody else was saying no. No, let's cross the street, pretend we didn't see her. So uh, it's quite a change today, and I owe my sobriety to all of you, to the wonderful old-timers that we all heard today, to the two absolutely fantastic speakers, Alan on NAA, my friend Paul, my friend Joan, that we heard last night, who stressed welcome, and um because I was so non-wanted when I came here, that welcome was very special to me. And they said welcome to me, and we've said welcome to you, and uh, we mean it. And I felt like you meant it for me because I stuck around. And uh, you did not ask me where I came from, what I did for a living, uh where I had lived, uh, where I hadn't lived, what I had done, what I hadn't done. You just said welcome. As a matter of fact, um, I said nothing because uh, I didn't trust you. And I thought when you found out who I was, you weren't going to let me back in. So I figured, well, if I just keep quiet... That will be the only way that you'll allow me to stay. And uh, you didn't even ask me to say anything. You just told me to keep coming back. You know, and I learned and I saw from the steps as I cleared up that the word wasn't me. The word was we. And um, I had lived my whole life with me, I, me, I, not we. And uh, and so I have learned over the years because you've taught me that it's we. And I think the singleness of purpose is really our fifth tradition. We must be there for the alcoholic who still suffers because where else does that person have to go? Uh, we have other anonymous fellowships, and God knows I could qualify for quite a few of them. And just because we're alcoholics doesn't mean we don't have other problems. But if my problem, for the most part, is alcohol, then I have to make sure that this fellowship in the I am responsible for holding out the hand of AA has to be there for all the people that are going to come in, for all the people that are out there still suffering. And we all know at least one. I just came back from the coast. My oldest and dearest friend who was in the fellowship had a heart attack, and she's now in a coma. And her son is my godson, and he's drunk. And... uh I knew that I couldn't say to him, don't drink, because people said to me, I think you're drinking too much, and I went, you know what I said, I don't have to, (laughs) but but when I was ready, when the pupil is ready, the teacher appears, um, I said to him, don't drive, because he lives out in the country, and I thought to myself, either you'll hurt yourself or you'll hurt somebody else, and, and we won't get over that so easily. And he agreed not to drive. So um, at least it was an awakening. And he knows I'm in the fellowship, and he knows his mom is there. And while it's a very trying time for us all, um, 
I am realizing that that he needs a place to go when he's ready. And uh, and there were people out there. I live in downtown Manhattan. There were drunks on the street all over the place. They need a place to go if they get ready. Because I'm blessed today. I'm not sitting here because I woke up one morning and said, gee, I messed up my whole life. Uh, I did terrible things. I drank, and then it got worse. And then I drank some more, and then it got worse. And uh, And now I think I'll go to Alcoholics Anonymous. What time is it? Oh, I think there must be a meeting just about now. I didn't do it that way. You know, I tried everything for as long as I could, including staying dry on my own. And uh, when I felt like dying and when I f- hoped that, you know, the, the world would fall in on me and when I couldn't think of another thing to do, I checked myself into a detox, and in that detox, they had Alcoholics Anonymous, which I had never heard of. Somehow it had floated by my very fuzzed up brain, so it wasn't like I knew from a friend or a relative. Or I had never heard of it. I think I had seen Days of Wine and Roses, but I don't remember what happened to them because I generally blacked out somewhere in the middle of the movie. And I know the beginning and the end of a lot of movies, and I haven't a clue what happened in the middle. And so I saw a lot of old movies over and over again when I got sober and said, oh, okay, you know, but, but, but that was part of my life that I accepted as this was okay, you know, and now all of a sudden here I am in detox with paper slippers, feeling absolutely disgusting, uh, having, you know, major stomach troubles, major skin troubles, major uh, digestive troubles, and all the stuff that would be better left undescribed. And they're telling me there's an AA meeting, and I'm going, what's that? And there's somebody at the door that looks like Edgar G. Robinson. He's going, oh, ho, ho. And I'm saying, oh, my God, it's come to this. And um, I had come from the world of rock and roll, you see, so I was used to a lot of strange people, but not quite this strange, you know. And uh, they told a story that had nothing to do with me. But the feelings were the same. They didn't drink in the same places I drank. But the feelings were the same. And, and, and they recovered. And they didn't talk about their new apartment or their old car or their lousy boss or, you know, they may have thrown that in to tell me that in spite of all these problems they didn't drink, but I didn't hear a lot of other things because my poor little brain couldn't handle a lot of other things. And so I heard, don't drink, go to meetings. You know, later on when I got a little more sober, once I got out of there and I cleared up a little bit, it was don't drink, go to meetings and help another alcoholic if you can. And uh, that to me does not sound like singular. It sounds like a couple of things, but what do I know? You know, uh, I started thinking when, when Floyd asked me to speak on this about the word singular versus the word primary. And I've always used our primary purpose is to stay sober and help another alcoholic. And it's written like that in the preamble, which was the first thing that made me comfortable. I didn't believe in a higher power. I was certainly was frightened of all of you. I didn't trust any of you. I was sure this was like you were going to ask me to to do something I didn't want to do. I was looking for a way out. But the preamble answered all my fears. It told me that, you know, you didn't care about all the stuff that the outside world cares about. All you cared about was was helping me stay sober, helping us stay sober, and helping the newcomer come in and stay sober. And that that was, that was it. That was our primary purpose. And we didn't have dues and fees and we weren't allied with anybody else and you didn't have to argue about whether you needed to sit on this side or that side or it was all okay. And I first came in, I was a recovering drug addict as well as a recovering alcoholic. So I told you that. And you didn't throw me out. I said, oh, I'm a cross-addicted alcoholic. I'm a duly addicted alcoholic. I'm a, you know, I could have thought of 20 more and does to add to my alcoholism, all of which are 
true. But um, you told me to think of this house as, as a house that was keeping me sober, a good orderly direction, you told me, since I didn't believe in a higher power when I first walked in. And you told me to honor this house. And in the same way as I had friends who were vegetarian, and I wouldn't have walked into their house with a raw hamburger, you know? Or I wouldn't have walked into a friend of mine who didn't smoke, and I did smoke at the time, smoking a cigarette or a cigar or some other stuff. Um, I said, okay, I get that. You know, uh, banners were taught so that we could get along with each other. That's what manners are for. I say please or excuse me or thank you because I'm trying to communicate to you that I want to get along with you. I don't do it for any other reason. And so we have this thing that we try and be civilized. And and uh, so I wasn't going to talk about my heroin addiction and my uh, other substance addictions and my... Uh, you know, over this and under that and too much and too little and not often enough and, oh, boy, doesn't that feel great and all of that stuff because, you know, starting out with sugar and caffeine, I could just go down the list. Anything I like, I tend to do more of than I should. I am that kind of drunk, and the steps have taught me to acknowledge that in myself. So I'm a little careful. I I mean, when I got the computer, it was the first 86 hours on the computer. My eyes started to twirl like this. And I realized that I had to sort of pull back a little bit. And say, and, but I do that all the time. You know, um, recently I broke my wrist. And uh, because I'm sober, I felt it. And uh, I went to the doctor, and they operated, and they put in a thing that made me look like Igor. And I walked around for, with that for six weeks. And then they gave they go, gave me therapy. And I went, fortunately, to a lady in the program who was giving me the therapy. And uh, she said, oh, here's some putty. Do this. Do some exercises. And I decided, well, if 10 minutes is good, 10 hours is much better. And I promptly developed tendonitis. So I know that this drunk is still a work in progress and that I have to moderate, which is not a word that comes easily to me, and that my primary purpose is not to discuss my wrist with you but to discuss my drinking with you and to apply all those isms that I have to all the other things. And fortunately for me, this fellowship, Ship gives me what I need through the steps, the traditions, and the concepts. It, it shows me that my primary purpose is not to drink anything after that. I hopefully can learn from you and be clear enough to get from you, and that will be a good thing for me. And I will end up sharing that because anything you've ever given me, I haven't had to keep to myself. I've been told if I got it, I share it with you. And that's been such a beautiful gift because you gave it to me unconditionally. You didn't say to me, here, I'm going to share something with you and it's only for you. You said to me, no, if you want what we have, you do what we do. And you kindly and gently and lovingly took me down the road and said to me, this will work here, this won't work there. You make a mistake, that's okay. Just don't drink and go to meetings. And I've been able to do that a day at a time. And it's been, you know, it's been absolutely awesome to me because I didn't think I'd last five minutes here. And you told me to keep coming, whatever I thought. And I'm still thinking too much. And you tell me, that's okay, keep coming. And, uh, you know, and I've been giving a lot of a lot of thought to the word singleness of purpose because I have found in Alcoholics Anonymous that the worst thing we can do is be exclusionary. We have today a worldwide fellowship, and we have many worlds yet to go in many countries that don't have us. And some of them have totally different customs, totally different ways of looking at things. And um, I think that AA is for everybody. There are um, 
introductions in the big book when it's written for uh, the Russians when they were in communist country and for other countries that have different mores and even for us in the 21st century that say this book was written in 1935. Don't think of it as sexist. Don't think of it, think of it as old fashioned if you choose. But get past that because the message is working for us today. And so we're not looking to degenderize it. We're not looking to change it. We're not looking to replace words that may trigger something for you, but not for me. After all, Alcoholics Anonymous started with two gentlemen. I am certainly not that. And uh, it started with uh, people who were middle-class Christians. And so there's, there's room to expand. It's now become a, a God as you understand it. However you seek to use that, whether you use good orderly direction, group of drunks. So when you use the word singular, be careful, because the guy that walks in and the guy who says, well, you know, I have a problem with drugs, or a drug is a drug is a drug. Well, having had drugs and alcohol, I can tell you there's a difference, and I need to be here. But that person doesn't know that any more than I did. 90 days, you want to give that person 90 days, you want to give that person at least a week or two to clear up, just don't throw them out, because we could be killing them. You could have killed me if you had listened to all my nonsense when I first came in, if I had dared to even share it with you. You know, uh, let's be broad-minded. You don't want, I always end meetings that I chair was we have a nice way of closing if you choose to do it. You don't have to pray. You don't have to say whatever it is that, you object to. You don't have to do anything, but we suggest that you don't drink, because if you don't drink, you will clear up enough to figure out what it is that's comfortable for you and not comfortable for you. And if I try and exclude you at any place along the way, I'm doing myself and you a great disservice. One of my passions has been special needs, as many of you in this room know. And I have felt very keenly the isolation of the person who doesn't hear and who doesn't speak and who doesn't see and, and who can't read. And it doesn't say any place in the big book that you have to read to be sober, you know? So I can read to that person. I can lead that person to a seat. I can wheel that person in. I can get somebody to interpret for that person. I don't have to exclude it. People go, oh, special needs, we're not, we're not social workers, we're not this, we're not. No, we're, of course we're not. But we're alcoholics and we know, we understand that pain, that isolation, that, that, that horrible feeling that we all have that makes us want to drink. And what it takes to make us not want to drink is that we go to any lengths. And uh, <clears throat> uh, I have been very privileged when 9-11 uh, happened to be part of a group that brought a meeting of Alcoholics Anonymous to people down at the World Trade Center, and it saved my life because I didn't know where I was going to go with that. And uh, some of those people belong to different anonymous programs. And so we just made it friends of Bill W. Because I could not see myself saying, oh, you're a drug addict or you're a gambler. You can't come in here and seek the 12 steps of recovery because this is an AA meeting. I couldn't see myself doing that. We were down there so desperate and so into the desire for fellowship and the knowledge that we had to keep each other sober, clean, or whatever one more day that we just called it Friends of Bill W., as a matter of fact, one um, Army gen sergeant came up to me one day, and he said, my name is Bill W., and who are these friends of his that got a room upstairs? 
and uh, is there a party? And I said, well, you're welcome to come up, you know, but uh, we deal with the 12 steps, and it's a nice, quiet place, and we have some literature and a blackboard. And uh, oh, no, he says, I don't need it, but bless you. Another guy, they were, they were using a room in the hotel, and he, and he said to me, when you see that guy, we closed it at midnight, the hotel room. He said, when you see that guy, Bill W., he says, would you thank him for me? He says, I get to sleep there at night, and I'm so tired. And they put a mattress down, and then you all come back at 6. And I don't know what you do, but it's so nice of you to let me sleep here. And I said, oh, I think he's a very nice guy, too. And... uh <laughs> He does a lot for me. And uh, and so that was it. We didn't even have to know who we were, what we were doing. We just had to know that we were all in the, in a, in a terrible situation, seeing our way out and doing the next right thing for each other without singularing out any one person. And today, I can be back to my primary purpose. I've had the privilege to serve this area. Um, I hope to continue to do that a day at a time, and uh, I thank you for the opportunity to share. Thank you, Cookie. And now I'd like to introduce another wonderful alcoholic, Alan. Hi, everybody. My name is Alan W. I am an alcoholic. I'm very grateful to be here tonight, and I also thank Floyd, Sini's alternate delegate, for inviting us to share at this theme meeting, and um, our good thoughts are with him as he's not feeling very well tonight. And I thank also I want to thank Naomi for jumping in and doing such a good job of chairing this meeting. I was. Uh, Speaking to Cookie, Cookie earlier this week, I said, I have no idea what I'm going to say about, you know, this theme. And she said, Alan, you know your story. Just get up there and say anything. You know, it'll be fine. And I was thinking about um, this theme, our singleness of purpose, the cornerstone of AA. I remember the intergroup seminar I went to about a year and a half ago in Pittsburgh. And uh, the theme was our primary purpose. So before the weekend was over, I was out shopping, and I saw in a store window in Pittsburgh this little green glass porpoise. So I bought it, and I called that my primary porpoise. <laughs> and it just keeps me, I keep it in the, kitchen, in the kitchen, and every time I see it, I smile, and I remember it's, it's all about being happy. Sobriety is about smiling and, and enjoying ourselves. And... um I think this theme has a lot to do with enabling us to do that. I um, also, as Cookie had mentioned, you know, sometimes uh, we, in our preamble, it says definitely our, our primary purpose. And this theme is our singleness of purpose. And then we can just get just as crazy as anybody else discussing the difference between our singleness of purpose and our primary purpose. But both of them have the word porpoise in it, so it's okay. And I, um, I told Linda, the grapevine chair, I was going to refer to a new book that the grapevine published last year. It's called Thank You for Sharing. And it's 60 years of letters to the AA grapevine. And it's very interesting. There's one chapter in here. It's about 20 letters, about 20 pages. And the title is Our Primary Purpose protecting AA's singleness of purpose. So both of those are covered for these letters. And um, so rather than hear an opinion from me, I'm telling you where you can get 20 different opinions from AA members over the last 60 years about our singleness of purpose and our primary purpose. And um, I am grateful to be sober and also this theme talks about a cornerstone, and I'm not going to start, like uh, Liz said, you're going to start talking about archways and keystones, and I really don't, I'm not that much of an engineer, but uh, I do know a cornerstone is something to do with the foundation, and um, 
in my foundation, when I came into AA, I learned very, very early on, when I was in detox, I learned to identify with the speaker and don't compare. And I think Cookie did a good job of demonstrating different ways, like we're all different, yet we have the same problem, the same solution. And uh, I remember in detox, I was like a few days sober. It's a detox treatment center in Nassau County. My home group is Westbury Advent Group in Nassau County. And there's people in this room from there, so I gotta be really honest. And, uh, but there was a speaker that came in from the intergroup, uh, institutions committee and he spoke at night. Now, I mean, I thought these people were all salaried and everything, you know, but they were volunteers. And, uh, this young man, he was a lot younger than I was. And, um, very different than me. If you saw us together, we didn't look like we'd drink together or get sober together or even want to talk to each other. But he told his story and I identified with him. He talked about being a lonely little kid and didn't fit in anywhere and I felt that, you know, I identified with that, not being comfortable at all when I was a kid. He talked about learning to drink when he was a teenager and I identified with that too because I remember one day we cut out of school. We went over to this girl's house, you know, and, uh, and we drank. And it's the first time I remember getting drunk, you know, when I was a young teenager. And it was like magic, you know, it was like, got me out of myself, made me feel like I was part of these other kids, could laugh and talk, and, and, uh, felt like I belonged. And, um, I still remember parts of that day. And I remember getting up and falling over the furniture and walking into the lamps and, and, uh, getting real silly. And I remember people losing some tolerance with me, but, I was new at it, you know, so I had to practice a lot. <laughs> and I did. I practiced for about 20 years. And this, this, this young man who spoke that night at the, at the treatment center, he did the same thing. He drank and he practiced for like a lot of years and never quite got it right, you know. And, and, um, as he did, my Drinking progressed, so I got into more trouble than just walking into walls. I, uh, from Long Island, we drive cars a lot, and I started crashing into telephone poles and trees and things with the car. And um, actually, it was about, I think about for about 15, in 15 years, I had about 10 car accidents, and they were all because I was drinking. And... Um, and I didn't ever really hurt another person because I, I was always alone in a car and always hit these stationary objects, you know, that would just jump in the middle of the car, you know, in the middle of the road. And uh, I could always say, well, you know, this, the, the road was wet, you know. <laughs> you know, it's like, you know, it had nothing to do with my drinking. But this guy, he spoke that night. He um somehow would fall off of buildings. You know, it sounds insane, but he was, you know, he was a, he was an alcoholic, same as I was, and I identified with that. And he would fall off these buildings. One building was a five story building. And uh he would live and they get put in the hospital and they patch him up, you know, put him back together and he just keep drinking, you know, and and I listened to him and I said, that sounds like he's crazy. You know, how could he get in such damage and put himself back in the same predicament, drink again. And then I realized, you know, my last car accident, another tree jumped in the middle of the road, and and, uh, and I was pinned, and there's pin in that car, and it was not the first time I was pinned to a, in a car, you know, and I saw this uh, windshield shatter in front of me, and, uh, and I was stuck. It was the middle of the afternoon, and I was... Um, couldn't get out of the car, I couldn't move the car, and a policeman came up next to me, and he, I saw him, and I said, well, this is it. You know, I'm, I'm either going into the hospital or jail, or I'm going to die, you know, but I can't walk away from this, because I could walk away from all these other car accidents, you know, and lie. And uh, so I had an open bottle next to me in the car, and I just started drinking it right there in front of the cop. And he didn't believe it, you know, what I was doing. <laughs> And at the time, and sometimes even now, it still makes perfect sense. I mean, I was caught, and I couldn't walk away from that. You know, what am I going to do? So uh, 
I came out of that blackout in the hospital, and I spent quite a long time in the hospital that year. It was 1984. Cookie and I, by the way, have the same anniversary, August 6, 1985, right? Same exact day. And uh, I spent at least three months in the hospital that year. Well, it was March 31st till almost Labor Day, so I can't do the math, but... um, I had three major operations. I lost a kidney, had other things moved around inside me, and and I didn't die. I was alive. And it was just like this guy who jumped off the building and got patched back together and continued to drink. I got out of the hospital. It's Labor Day weekend, and I just continued to drink. Now, is that crazy? It, it's, uh, and it was like about a a year before I had my last drink. And um, it's so very important for me to remember that because that is um, insanity as far as I'm concerned. And we can, if we use these steps and um, come in here and respect our singleness of purpose, we can be restored to sanity enough not to drink a day at a time. And... um, I'll tell you another thing this man said, this young guy said that night. He uh, he was sober seven years, and he went to meetings, and, he's, and he had these terrible things going on in his life. His uh, wife ran away with his friend, you know, and they turned the kids against him and had lost his job. He um, didn't really have a place to live. He had all these awful situations in his life. But he said he did not have to drink one day at a time. And he never had to be alone again as long as he went to these meetings. And I listened to that. And I wanted very desperately to identify with that. You know, that maybe I don't have to be alone anymore. And I just, it was like a revelation. It was like, it sounds simple, but I mean, if you look at me silly, it's my reason to drink. You know, I mean, it's always, that was my answer to everything. So, um... I'm very grateful for that young man. I met him actually afterwards and thanked him. And um, I think it's, it was a great lesson to learn, to identify with the speaker and don't compare your story. Um, Cookie also mentioned the, the co-founders, Dr. Bob and, and Bill Wilson. I should I say Bill W. But uh, he... Um, they met, and they found a way to do it. They spoke to each other. They identified. They were two different type people, too. So they probably didn't compare their stories. They just identified with each other. And they found a way to stay sober. Now, they could have just went home and stayed sober. But they didn't. And we saw, we saw that play last night that, that uh, Robbie put together for our speaker tonight from southern New Jersey and it was very funny, and, and it was about uh, co-founders going to the hospital for the man in the bed, you know, and, and carrying a message. So they had a need to pass it on. They had a need to the solution that they found to pass on to somebody else and to strengthen their sobriety. And we have um, Cookie and I served as delegates for this area. She was uh, 1999 and 2000, and I was right after her, year one and two. And uh, we've been on lots of committees, and we've this topic has come up many times about our singleness of purpose. And um, there is a statement that's in our literature for the treatment centers and professionals that states our singleness of purpose. So we tell the treatment centers, we tell the professionals what we are and what we're not. It's in our preamble. And... Um, Whoever they send here, it's up to us then. It's very important that we continue to go to meetings. If we've got it over a year sobriety, we just don't go home and learn stay sober. We stay here and give it back and improve our own sobriety at the same time. And um, that's our responsibility. And we can suggest and guide the beginners and newcomers that come in here, how to practice these principles 
and use these steps for their own sobriety. And there is a, um, it's very serious. I think this, this slogan, I mean, this uh, theme, our singleness of purpose, it's for our AA unity. It's important. Um, I don't think we're trying to exclude anybody. I think we're just reminding ourselves of what we are. It's important before we get a little crazy to bring it back home. And um, I um, just am very grateful that that we have this. The uh, um, the the the, the uh, not only the theme but the. The title of our fellowship is Alcoholics Anonymous, so it reminds us what we're about and what we are. And um, I just also want to congratulate the committee for this convention. The topics that they chose had a lot to do with unity and uh, traditions. And um, we have the freedoms. Actually, today's Daily Reflections had something talked about AA freedoms. And we have freedoms. It's all suggestions, and nobody says you have to get a sponsor. Nobody says you have to do this. We have the choice. But it's also, um, even if a group has um, the right to be wrong, and the fourth tradition talks about autonomy, it's important that we pay attention to keeping the fellowship together because that's where our security is, that's where our safety is. There's no way that my home group or Cookie's home group or anybody's home group could put on an event like this this weekend or, ha or produce the literature that you've seen on the tables out, out in the hall and the grapevine magazines or, or have uh, the archives that you've seen in this room over here. It's took a fellowship for over 60 years, all around the world, like she said. And it's still growing, it's still saving lives, and I just think it's up to us. We lead by example. If we're sober, don't go home and stay that way, come here and give it back. And um, we have, gonna end a little early, because we have to get ready for dinner. And uh, I just thank you all so much. You all look so beautiful sitting out there. Thank you. Thanks for listening. I hope you enjoyed the podcast. Sobercast is ad-free, and we'd like your help in order to keep it that way. So if you'd like to help us be self-supporting by pledging a dollar to a month, visit Sobercast.com and look for the donate links. Thank you very much.